And lastly, but not leastly, we have Dr. Kara Fitzpatrick here. She is a psychologist in the Stanford Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Pediatrics. She specializes in neuropsychological assessment of eating disorders and an evaluation of treatments for children and adolescents. Her current research uh, uh, focuses on the development of cognitive remediation treatment, CRT, which utilizes neuropsychological components to address cognitive and behavioral difficulties associated with eating disorders. In addition to working as a therapist on research treatment studies, she also provides supervision to the therapists on the different treatment modalities. So my presentation is quite different from what you've had before because you've sort of gotten the nuts and bolts. What does it look like? What might we do about it? What should we be afraid of? The talk that I'm going to give is, is quite different because what I'm really interested in, and I think most people who treat eating disorder should be interested in, is what's the effect on the brain? Because the brain is, in fact, the major organ that helps direct behavior. And when we think about eating disorders, we really think about behavioral disrupted systems. So when we think about um, the neurocognitive features of eating disorders, there are really three broad domains that we look at. And these are what we call neurocognitive inefficiencies. So let me be very clear here. People with eating disorders generally have very good cognitive processing. We see IQs in the normal or even above normal range. These are generally people who are going to school, doing well, successful in their careers. So we're not talking about someone with difficulties um, that you would see as glaringly impairing. Instead, what we're talking about are inefficiencies, very small areas in which we see changes in functioning that should be concerning to us because they seem to be a pattern or they in, um, will impede behavioral change in other ways. And the three things that we generally pay attention to is something called weak central coherence, which I'll describe in just a moment in more detail, difficulties in set shifting or cognitive flexibility, ability to change your mind or think about other things, and impulsivity or inhibitory control. And it's really this last one that sort of distinguishes anorexia and bulimia nervosa from one another. Weak central coherence is a concept that was actually derived from the autism literature. And um, whenever I give this talk and I say to people, it's an overly detailed style of thinking, people say, well, I'm detail-oriented. Does that mean that I'm at risk? No overly or clinically detail-oriented. We're talking about a style of thinking that focuses so much on the details that it misses the larger category or gestalt. If you think about it, the way our brains learn is very categorical. When little kids are learning how to talk, they might go through a phase where they call every woman mama. You guys kind of remember that stage? those of you who've been around kids? Well, your brain is learning how to categorize things, and it's figured out this concept. People who look a certain way, and believe it or not, kids are actually better at identifying gender than grown-ups are, go, oh, well, that's the label that I'm going to put on it. And over time, we become more detailed. In eating disorders, one of the things that we see is this failure to um, appreciate or gather the large concept, and instead of focus on the detail or elements of that process, so it obscures the bigger picture. And this has some really significant effects when it comes to learning and memory as well. If you don't understand the category to put something in, your brain will sort of file it away just as a random piece of paper. So the way your brain works is imagine um, a file drawer with a large number of file folders. When something fits into a category, you'll slip it into the file folder. But if you don't know what file folder it goes into and you just drop it in the drawer, What's going to happen when you go to look for it later? Louder. <laughs> you can't find it. The same thing happens on a neurocognitive level when we pay too much attention to details and fail to put something in a gestalt or in a larger picture. It actually leads to poorer recall of both the big picture and the details. This is also important for abstract reasoning or integration of information. So if you want to think about how adult brains work, we make connections between large categories, concepts, or ideas. But in fact, if we have failure to understand categories, we're actually going to be impaired in our ability to make connections between one thing or the other between two things that may be similar but unrelated but can be useful to draw in to understand something moving forward. Does that sort of concept make sense to you? So we've got people who've got a very detail-oriented process. Now, this can be damaging for understanding the things that I've talked about before, but can be really useful 
when you need to be nitpicky about details. So who can find the face in the coffee bean? Just raise your hand when you think you see it. Somebody's got it really fast. A couple of people. Overly detailed processing actually helps you with tasks like this, where you're trying to find the small piece of information. Not a lot of you have raised your hands. I'm hoping more of you guys have found it at this point in time. Let me see if I can find him. Hmm. Oh, where, oh, where? I, I don't know that I can reach it. Is it this one right here? <laughs> so. Let me back up and see if I can do him. Oh, that's so where are you, dude? He's right there. He's right where? Ah, right there. That's his little head right there. <laughs> this is fun, isn't it? This is actually what I do for a living. I get to do things like this for work. So in addition to central coherence, we also talk about set shifting. Set shifting is a core skill that we develop in adolescence and adulthood. And it's really thinking flexibly, being able to move fluidly between thoughts, ideas, and concepts. And it's really strongly related to problem solving. If you can't think of anything but what you're thinking about, you're going to have a hard time solving your problem. If you think that the only solution is the same solution you've tried before, you're going to have a hard time solving your problem. But this is also related to aspects of future planning and managing ambiguity. Because ambiguity by definition, which most adolescents' lives are somewhat ambiguous. If you don't remember, you probably are happy you don't remember. Because you don't know what job you're going to have, what college you're going to get into, where you're going to live, what you're going to do, or who's going to do your laundry. The other thing that's really important is recognizing that set shifting is actually critical to our daily functioning and skills in life. Behavioral or cognitive rigidity, that black and white thinking that people sometimes have, is actually difficulty in set shifting. The other thing that difficulties in set shifting can lead to are perfectionistic or perseverative behaviors. And by perseverative behaviors, what I mean are sort of behavioral sets, habits, or ideas that get played out in a repeated pattern that's very similar. So this can be, I call it the sit and spin, where you're sitting in one place and you're working really hard, and all you're doing is spinning around in a circle having the same thought again and again. But probably most importantly, Set shifting is really a core feature of social situations. If you think about any conversation you've ever had, it's fundamentally a set shifting exercise. You are listening to someone while also formulating your own thoughts. That's holding at least two things in your mind. Now, if you're really good at having conversations, you might also be trying to pay attention to their nonverbal behaviors. So now you're holding three things in your mind, and you're trying to make sure that your reactions to them are the way you want your reactions to be. That's four things now. Ability to be smooth and dynamic, to change your mind, to think flexibly, are core set-shifting abilities. And it's really critical to understand that set-shifting abilities develop the most during adolescence. From the ages of, say, 12 to 24, we know that this is a critical time not only for brain change and development, but for these specific skills. Impulsivity and inhibitory control are also major tasks that we're learning how to use and develop more during adolescence. So little children are also often quite impulsive. And then they get a little bit better at it, and then they get into high school, and they kind of get a little worse at it again. Has anybody ever noticed that? Develops not, development's not always a nice, even curve. And that's actually true of these processes. Those with anorexia nervosa have actually been found to exhibit greater inhibitory control. In fact, there's some suggestion that one of the things that sets people up to develop anorexia nervosa is a thinking style or um, even utilizing certain parts of the brain in a way that makes it easier to not do than to do, easier to inhibit. So where for some, most of us it's very effortful, um, we went out for lunch earlier and uh, got truffles. This was yes, uh, Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday. And we had a whole bunch of truffles in my car and a two-hour car ride. Um, there was a lot of effortful control going on in the car <laughs> to prevent us from eating those truffles on the way home. But for people with anorexia nervosa, effortful control actually seems to be a baseline process, and there's less cognitive energy actually needed to, I hate to use the word restrict because I mean this in a behavioral and not a food way, but it's easier to not do based on the way the brain is set up.